Well, with all of the good that uh, uh, BYOD has, has uh, created, there are a lot of risks that have developed and, and that employers can address uh, if they really stay vigilant about it and stay on top of it. Uh, one of the first things that they have to uh, deal with, an employer has to deal with, is the issue of the employee's privacy rights. Um, now you have workplace information on a device shared with an employee's private information. Uh, and, and how do you deal with that sort of uh, dilemma there? Now, Pat, I'd assume it would be important to keep employees informed about the latest BYOD policies. One of the things that you have to lay out at the outset if you're going to allow your employees to use their own devices, if you're going to have a BYOD policy in the workplace, uh, is to be upfront with the employee. Um, we know that if an employer has a computer at work, and the employee is using that computer at work, the employee has no right to privacy. There is no legitimate expectation that whatever the employee does on there, it can be viewed by the employer, it can be uh, revealed in litigation, it can be explored in any time in any way that the employer wants to. That's not necessarily the same for my cell phone or my smartphone. Uh, if I'm storing private information on there, uh, you can't just automatically go in and, and look at that information. Um, so employers need to recognize that. Employers need to get a policy uh, up front. Employers need to address this specifically with the employees and in very plain and simple terms tell them, look, uh, there may be a time down the road where we're going to have to go into this smartphone or this other device. And we're going to have to extract information. Uh, and it may be that your privacy, uh, your, your private emails, your private information is going to be viewed by somebody else. It may be that we're going to have to do something to this device that's going to wipe that information out. And we'll talk about that in, in, in a couple seconds, too. So you have to be upfront about that. There are federal laws uh, and state laws which address this. Some of them have severe civil penalties, and some of them actually uh, state that it's a crime if you go and you do this without the employee authorization. What other issues related to privacy do employers need to be concerned about? Related to that is this whole issue of the data that's on there and what if I have to go in there and what if I have to um, pull something out that's going to damage your private information? Uh, what if you lose your personal device? What if it's stolen? Uh, what if you quit or uh, I fire you and you walk away with the personal device? Um, there is software that enables someone remotely to wipe out all of the data on one of these devices. Uh, if that's the case, if you lose your cell phone, uh, the employer may want to tell you right up front, look, we have this software and we're going to install it if you want to comply, if you want to participate in our BYOD program uh, that's going to allow a remote swipe. Um, so these are the types of things that your IT department really has to jump on and I think that, you know, large companies uh, are on top of this type of thing. I, I believe that there's actually software that will enable an employer to separate the two. Um, so that you are going to have uh, software that's going to keep all of your emails and your calendar and your work-related information separate and it's going to be managed separately and your personal data is going to be on this other side of the wall, if you will, uh, and that software should be installed uh, and it should go hand-in-hand -in -hand with training you on exactly how we want you to handle this. So there should be security, uh, login information, passwords and things like that to get to your uh, your private or, or your workplace information in there. So workplace uh, privacy concerns is something that can be addressed in, in a multiple, uh, multiple ways, your IT department and your policy. Now, Pat, in some cases, employees may be using these devices to share highly confidential information. If a device is lost or stolen, for example, there's the potential of compromising an organization's intellectual property or even trade secrets. I'm sure you'd agree that that type of loss would be very serious. If you are carrying this information around now on your smartphone, on your iPad, on your uh, laptop, uh, what happens if it's stolen? What happens if you allow someone to borrow your laptop? They're going on vacation for a week. Yeah, take my laptop. Don't worry about it. Uh, and someone else has access to this stuff. Uh, what happens if you're hooking up to an unsecured network somewhere? Uh, and all of this information now is potentially someone can hack into this easily. Um, 
again, the software that may be installed to prevent this type of stuff, even antivirus software should be installed. Uh, your IT department should be taking care of that. But your policy, uh, your HR department should be issuing these policies to address all of these things. How should I be, how should I be dealing with this? And, and does the employee want to sacrifice the right to enable some family member or friend to use their device? Because your policy is going to say, look, you're, you shouldn't be giving your device to somebody else, even a casual friend, even family member to use, because it could jeopardize this kind of information. So another concern that has to be addressed is that, the confidentiality and the trade secret information. One of the other bigger issues that develops in any company um, is the preservation of information uh, when there's a lawsuit or even when there's a threat of a lawsuit. So under our rules of civil procedure, um, once an employer even gets a whiff of the fact that someone's got a claim, they've got an obligation to take affirmative steps to preserve information and to lock it down. And the audience is probably received many of these uh, do, uh, letters uh, in the past, but the litigation hold letter will come out from legal and it's going to tell all these interested parties that you need to make sure that you preserve all of this hard copy information that you may have related to the lawsuit and your emails and anything else that's on the computer system, uh, your network that relates to the lawsuit. And that's a a large task anyway, and, and your IT folks will tell you that, you know, that, that that's a chore to go for a period of two, three, four years or longer and preserve all, this, all, the, all of this information. So now you have a workforce that has maybe not only one personal device with employer-related information on it, but maybe three. And so you have 10, 50, 100 employees that may have information related to this lawsuit and the litigation hold goes out to all of them and they're told to preserve this information on their personal devices. Um, that's a cost factor. That's going to increase the, the, the cost of engaging in this sort of litigation hold and the e-discovery in producing all of this information. Um, and the employee, again, should be advised up front that, look, there may come a time where we're going to actually take your personal device and we're going to download information from it. Uh, and when we do that, there may be a time when your personal information may be produced as well. Um, so they have to know up front that, that they're, they're, they're giving away some privacy rights and, and they are uh, expected to understand that when you get one of these litigation hold letters uh, that you're not out there carelessly uh, deleting information and so on and so forth. And, and the cost is, is going to be much, much more, I think, if you have a, a, a lawsuit like that. And what are the issues that are either forgotten or fall through the cracks when firms are building and documenting their BYOD policy? Another area, I think, um, which probably is, is, is something that we don't have to talk about too much, but you know, all of the uh, policies that, that are in place regarding workplace harassment, uh, regarding anti-discrimination, obviously that applies not only face-to-face, -face, but it applies through what we say in emails and so on and so forth. And I've just found that um, there's a certain casualness that, that, that uh, comes into play when I'm using my own smartphone, when I'm uh, at home on my laptop or using my iPad. And, and I think employees just need to be reminded that all of the things we're not supposed to say and do to one another face to face, we're not supposed to do it on our, uh, our, on our smartphone either. And, and, you know, that's in your policies. Uh, I think that's probably going to be useful thing to reiterate in your BYOD policy. Now, Pat, any other related issues you'd like to address? Finally, I guess one area that um, has to be addressed, and, and, and it actually is, is a problem not only if you have a BYOD policy, but even if you just have your employee cell phone number, and it's this whole area of off-the-clock work. And by that, I mean the following. Uh, you know, an exempt employee is somebody who, by definition, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, they don't get paid overtime uh, because they've met this particular definition, they're exempt. Your non-exempt employees uh, get paid overtime when they work over 40 hours a week. So I work 40 hours a week, I get my regular rate of pay. For every hour I work over that, I get paid time and a half, and that's for every single work week that I work. So 
Let's give an example of a service rep who's somebody that's out on the road and they're fixing your product all over that service rep's territory. The service rep gets called now in the morning and, and you have a BYOD policy that applies and, and the service rep has a laptop, the service rep has uh, a smartphone. And the manager's calling the service rep first thing in the morning before he or she's even on the road and giving them the lowdown of what the day is, what they should do with this particular customer, at that particular customer. And then at the end of the day, the service rep has to go home and answer a bunch of emails, file a, a bunch of reports, uh, and is perhaps even taking additional phone calls, troubleshooting, and all kinds of things like that. So the 40-hour work week that they're punching the clock on, all of a sudden, realistically, is a 50-hour work week. And let's say that this rep is making $20 an hour. So they've got 10 hours of overtime at time and a half. 1.5 times 20 is $300 a week. Let's move that out to 50 weeks. Now we have a $15,000 a year number that potentially, if you're not paying this employee for this off-the-clock work, they can make a claim for that. You have a two-year statute of limitations under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So you multiply the $15,000 by two. You're at $30,000. Uh, you have the potential, if it's a willful violation, to add another year of time on that. So now you're up to $45,000. Uh, there are some states that you're doing business in that will double the damages, that will triple the damages. Um, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have the potential for liquidated damages, and they're going to double whatever the award is. So your $45,000 number is now $90,000 for this one employee. Uh, you have your own attorney's fees. You may have the attorney's fees on the other side, and that's one employee. So let's say you have 10 of these reps out there. You now have a, you have a, a seven-figure lawsuit that you're dealing with. Uh, let's say that you have a hundred of these reps out there. You know, this is the stuff that the class action lawyers are, are salivating about. And there's been multiple cases like that. But it's amazing how this issue can snowball. Any other examples you can share? I believe uh, there was a, a company that had, you know, thousands of these uh, repair people uh, that was in a class action suit a few years ago. So it's millions and millions of dollars at stake. And this off-the-clock thing is something that um, like I said I, when, when I first started talking about this, is it not only applies to a company that has a BYOD policy in place, but if I have my employee's cell phone number and I'm calling that employee up, um, that's potentially an off-the-clock time. And I've seen cases where even uh, people working at help, help desks, they're coming in in the morning and they've got to sit there for 15 minutes to boot up the computer and get ready, and they're filing claims with state or federal Department of Labor's, uh, you owe me 15 minutes a day times whatever. Uh, so it's something that you really have to, to be uh, vigilant about. You have to monitor it. Uh, you have to get down into the trenches with your managers to make sure that they are aware of this. And Pat, what do you recommend business leaders do to minimize the overall risk factors? Uh, people need to be trained about it. And again, this is something that should be addressed in a policy. And it's, it's a policy that is your BYOD policy, but you should have a policy on overtime. You should have a policy on harassment, all the things we talked about. So they're, they're all going to intermingle and, and sort of connect here.